question is co-living. And co-living means a lot of different things. I don't think we've really congealed around a definition of what is meant by that. I think the idea is an extension of the overall sharing economy and probably the models that are uh, prominent in Scandinavia and they're becoming more prominent, um, particularly in Europe, relate to clusters of eight to ten units around a centralized kitchen. The units in Scandinavia typically do have kitchens, but the community have a community meal once or twice a week. Maybe that services as a uh, that they're sharing childcare and that there's joint uh, recreational amenities for children. There's uh, facilities for the <clears throat> provision of uh, care for one another in those settings. That's not a model that has been particularly uh, tested in North America and the survey data shows that the vast majority of Canadians are not particularly interested in exploring it at present. Um, I think that it's likely that where we'll see it constructively deployed is with uh, single moms and with seniors, and possibly in conjunction with one another, because the biggest issue facing our senior population is isolation, and co-living is a natural solution for that. It's just getting our uh, family members adjusted to the idea that this could be a positive. It's already true in senior living facilities where people have communal meals and communal areas, and it's a trade-off to have someone caring for all of for the landscaping and for the central areas and the benefits of programming and so on. I think that it's well established in the context of a defined seniors community. What hasn't been developed really and proven yet, and I'm hopeful. I think that there's a role for it in our markets is the multi-generational environment where the benefits of having people around during the day, uh, having kids being cared for in their immediate communities, and having, particularly for busy parents, neighbors that you can count on because you know each other and you have a, a commitment to a communal aspect to your life is a, is a potentially strong positive. I think it's definitely here to stay and grow. I think it needs institutional capital support, and I think we're in the early stages of that. You've seen that across lots of different product types. Uh, I think early stages, institutions are probably slow to uh, absorb it. There is a lot of smart capital coming into the space. I think it certainly uh, creates uh, a solution around affordability. I think it's a really creative way um, in, in creating that solution. Uh, so I do think long term, it will be around. It's going to take a while for the institutions to really get into that space. I think once it does, it'll it'll be like any other product type, like traditional multifamily or condo. I'm not a, a huge believer in co-living. I think uh, between hotels, extended stays, um, you know, Airbnb options, I think that um, the, the amount of other options in the market uh, will, will be here. And I, I think that there is a place for co-living, uh, certainly in the student res residential market. Uh, there, there'll always be demand and a, and a type of co-living, but in terms of formal co-living in cities, I know that it has gained some traction in New York. Uh, I just don't see it as a widespread uh, you know, phenomenon in the Canadian market in, in most of our cities. I think that's a great topic. Um, I'm always ready for something that's new that will disrupt the industry because it helps us to uh, change our perspective on things. Co-living, similar to co-working, I believe is something that we should embrace. Uh, whether there will be immediate traction, I don't believe so because I think a number of stakeholders, including lenders, have to get comfortable in underwriting it, as we saw in the co-working space. But I think co-living provides a great opportunity, a different type of model for diff people with different lifestyle and different needs, as well as it provides a new option for affordability.